Chapter two, part two. First question, what is the price of a 6% two-year bond paying annual coupons if interest rates are 5%? So 6% two-year bond, how do you price bonds? Usually by looking at how much cash they get you. You discount those incoming cash. So how much cash will the bond get you in year one and in year two? You just add them together. Since this is a 6% bond, that means in the first year, you're going to get $6 in cash. And in the second year, you're going to six dollars in cash in coupon. But since it's a two-year bond, in the second year, you'll also get the redemption, which is the nominal value. So you're going to get 106 in the second year. But remember, you have to discount these cash by the discount rate. So you are given 5%. At this level, the CISI security is level three. CISI will never give you a bond, which is more than two years, the maturity of more than two years, never. Uh, because it will take you more time to calculate. So in this qualification, at this level, any bond CISI will ask you to calculate the price for is gonna be a two year bond. So the first year is $6, but we have to discount it by one plus 5%, which is one plus the rate. And in the second year, it's also one plus 5%. But since this is the second year to the power two, $6 over 1.05, six over 1.05, so this is actually 5.71 plus 106 divided by 1.05 to the power two. That's gonna give us 96.15. So we add these together. That's gonna give us 101.8. Eight, six. So the answer is D. Let's see what you, nobody got it right. So half of you said B and the other half said C. Right, we should learn from the mistakes. Moving on. Question number two, a bond with a 10% coupon matures in five years time is priced at 110. Estimate the gross redemption yield. Well, and now remember the gross redemption yield or the yield to maturity is, uh, is, is the annual yield uh, plus any capital gain or loss on redemption. So you can start by calculating the annual, the flat yield, Remember the flat yield or the annual yield is just the coupon over the price. Uh, what's the coupon? It's 10% over nominal $10 or 10 pounds. So you've got a 10 pound coupon over the price of 110. This tells you that the flat yield is 10 divided by 110 is 9.1%. Since he bought it at 110, he paid 110. When that bond is redeemed in five years, the issuer is gonna take that bond from him and give him only 100 pounds nominal. So on redemption, this investor is going to lose, on redemption, he's going to lose 10 pounds of his capital. Why? Because he paid 110 for the bond and on redemption, it was taken from him and he only got a hundred pounds. So he's gonna lose 10 pounds from uh, his capital. Now he's going to lose 10 pounds from his capital and he's holding the bond for five years. So technically every year, this investor is losing two pounds of his capital. 10 divided by five years of investing. Every year he's losing two pounds of his capital. He's getting a coupon of 10, but 
he is losing two pounds from his capital. He is getting a coupon of 10, but he is losing two pounds from his capital. So this is the calculation of the gross redemption yield. So eight over 110. So that's gonna give you 7.3%. And again, no one got it right. Now, there is a shortcut. If we know that the flat yield, which only considers coupon, is 9.21, and we know he is going to suffer a loss in his capital, why? Because he bought it above par, he's going to lose on redemption. We know for sure that the gross redemption yield for sure is going to be less than the flat yield. Why? Because the gross redemption yield is gonna absorb this loss. So we know for sure that the gross redemption yield is going to be less than 9.1. The only answer here is 7.3. So even without doing this calculation, you could have easily gotten the right answer. You could take the flat yield, which is just the coupon over the price, that gives you 9.1% return. And you're gonna say, okay, fine, he's gonna lose part of his capital. So the gross redemption yield or the lead to maturity is going to be less than 9.1 because that yield is gonna absorb that loss. So the only answer here is 7.3%. That's another way for you. In case you got a question like this, you could quickly arrive at the answer without having to calculate the gross redemption yield. More math. A six, five over eight percent. Let me just stop here. Since for many of you guys, it's been a very, very, very long time since high school, decades, maybe even centuries. So I'm just gonna tell you what is this six, five over eight. Five over eight is 0 0.65. So this here is 0 0.625. So six, five over eight is actually 6.625%. Just so that you guys do not panic. So a 6.625% commercial bond pays interest semi-annually to so every six months. So we're going to stop here. And well, you can divide it by half. It's fine. But I don't think it's going to make much of a difference, to be honest. On the 12th of July and the 12th of January, an investor buys a £10,000 nominal value of these bonds for a settlement on the 28th of August. Remember, uh, this bond pays on 12th of Jan and then on the 12th of July. So he buys it and that bond settles on the 28th of August. So obviously, since he bought it, he has to pay accrued interest to the seller. How much accrued interest does he have to buy? Does he have to pay? From the 12th of July till the 28th of August, if you count the number of days, that's 47 days. So he owes the seller 47 days of interest. When you buy a bond, you have to pay the guy who sold you the bond. You have to pay him for the accrued interest. So since this bond is using the actual number of days over 365, so we've got 47 over 365 times 6.625. So this is the annual coupon for the full year. How much are you going to pay for 47 days? Well, it's very easy. This times 47 days over 365. Remember, if CISI tells you to use the 360 convention, then you have to divide it by 360. But usually, 
in this qualification, usually you're gonna get the 365. So 47 times the annual 6.625. divided by 365 is gonna give you 0.8531 dollars. But remember, this is for every $100 of nominal. He bought $10,000. So obviously this is going to be 85.31. And most of you got it right. Nice. I, I, I was, I was, I was getting, I was panicking. I was getting scared there a little bit. Right. Moving on. A bond is yielding seven percent at a spread to LIBOR of three hundred and fifty basis points. If an index-linked gilt is yielding two percent, what is the spread to uh, LIBOR? So a bond is yielding seven percent. So the bond yield is 7%. And there is a spread between it and LIBOR of 3.5. That means this bond, which is given 7%, is LIBOR plus 350 basis point, or 3.50. So the spread of a bond and LIBOR is 350 basis points. That means this bond, which is yielding you 7%, the difference between it and LIBOR is 3.5. This tells us that LIBOR is automatically bringing a yield of 3.5. So LIBOR is 3.5 or 350 basis points. If an index linked guilt is yielding 2%, if the guilt is getting you 2%, what is the spread to LIBOR? So guilt, the spread to LIBOR, you're comparing the guilt to the LIBOR. What is the spread of the guilt to LIBOR? Because this is very important at this point. The guilt is 2% and LIBOR is 3.5. The spread between the guilt and the LIBOR is 2 minus 3.5. is going to give you minus 1.50% or minus 150 basis points. Not plus, because you're not comparing the LIBOR to the guilt. You're comparing the guilt to the LIBOR. Since the guilt is less than the LIBOR, the spread is negative. So the answer is B. And most of you got it right. Good. Moving on. Which of the following is true for a guilt trading above par? So, and let's just cancel some of the wrong answers quickly. The gross redemption yield, the yield to maturity, and the net redemption yield are very similar. The only difference is the net redemption yield is the gross redemption yield minus tax. So once you remove tax from the gross redemption yield or the yield to maturity, you get the net. So naturally, the net redemption yield is always less than the gross. So this one that says the net is higher than gross, this is wrong. And this one says the net is higher than the gross, this is wrong. This leaves us with choices B and C. Since we got this one right, this one right, we need to compare the flat yield and the gross redemption yield. Previously, we said, if you buy something, if you buy a bond above par, I think in the previous example, he bought it at 110 pounds, you are going to suffer a loss, a capital loss on redemption. Because the issuer is gonna take that bond from you and give you only nominal, which is 100. So you are going to lose 10 pounds from your capital. So in this case, the redemption yield is gonna absorb that loss. And the redemption yield, the gross redemption yield is gonna be less than the flat yield. So the answer is B. 
if in our previous example, the flat yield was 9.1%, the gross redemption yield was 7.3%. Why was it less? Because it absorbed that capital loss. And naturally, the gross redemption yield is going to be higher than the net, net uh, redemption yield because there is tax. So the answer is B. Only one person got it right. Next, which of the following is an incorrect statement when describing modifying duration? All other things being equal, longer maturity bonds have a higher modified duration than shorter maturity bonds. Remember, we're looking for incorrect. So we're looking for what is false. Longer maturity bonds have a higher modified duration than shorter maturity bonds. That's true. The longer the term of the bond, the riskier it is because you're going to wait longer to get back your money. Remember, modified duration is a measure of risk. It's a measure of sensitivity to interest rates. B, all other things being equal, high coupon bonds have a lower modified duration than low coupon bonds. Yes, high coupon bonds are less risk than low coupon bonds. Yes, that's right, because high coupon bonds pay you more. So every year you get more money back. And because you're earning more money, your risk is lower. So this is also true. All other things being equal, Low yielding bonds have a higher modified duration than a high yielding bond. Also true, because this is the opposite of the previous one. B and C are saying the same thing. All other things being equal, high yielding bonds have a higher modified duration than low yielding bonds. Nope. High yielding bonds have lower risk because they pay us more money. So this is false. So the answer is D. Next, which of the following would determine the shape of a normal yield curve? Let me see. So, ooh. So a normal yield curve looks like this. What does this tell you? It tells you that if you're looking at a shorter, short-term bond and a long-term bond, for the short-term bonds, investors are willing to accept a 1% yield. But for the long-term bond, investors are going to require at least a 5% yield, for example. So longer-term bonds, will require a higher yield. Why? Why would an investor in a normal situation require a higher yield from you for a longer term investment? That's natural because you are taking his money for a longer period of time. If you're going to take my money for five years, you better pay me for these five years. So the answer is liquidity. And none of you got it right. Everybody got it wrong. Determine the shape of a normal yield curve is the investor's liquidity preference. If the investor is somebody who is only willing to accept a short-term bond, then they are going to accept a smaller yield. If the liquidity preference is for a longer term, then they are going to ask you for a higher yield. Next. A two-year, 5% coupon bond is trading at par. Let me just stop here. What do you think the price of that bond would be? Since that bond is trading at par, you're not going to suffer any losses on redemption. Which of the following is closest to the price of a two-year, 3.5% bond? Assuming the required rate of return on both bonds is the same. Now, we are looking at the price of a two-year bond, which is paying us a 3.5% coupon. So in year one, 
we just make this normal table in year two. In the first year, it's going to give us a 3.5 pound coupon. In the second year, it's also going to give us a 3.5 pound coupon. But in the second year, it's also going to, since it's a two year bond, there's going to be a redemption. So we're going to get our nominal back. Now we need to discount these cash inflows. In this exam, in this question, it did not give us the required rate. It did not give us the discount rate. But since there is a very similar two-year bond that is paying a 5% coupon and it's trading at par, that means you buy it at 100 today, you will redeem at 100 in a few years, there is no capital gain or loss. For us, in this bond, in bond B, our discount rate would be considered the opportunity cost. Because if we invest in bond B, we are losing the investment of bond A. And bond A is a very similar bond, two years for both of them. So if I am going to discount bond B, what rate should I discount? I'm going to use this 5% at the discount rate. Again, if you are guaranteed to get a question on the valuation of a bond, the price of a bond. It always comes in the exam. You either get a question which is similar to what we saw earlier. CISI gives you the coupon, tells you two years, and then it tells you that the interest rate or the discount rate is 5%. Or CISI will not give you the discount rate, but CISI will tell you that a very similar bond, very similar to this one, two years, trading at par, has a coupon of 5%. That means you can use this 5% as a discount rate. So we'll just replace 5% here. Let me just erase this. So 3.5 over 5% in the first year. And in the second year, 103.5 discounted by 5% squared. So let's do the calculations quickly. 3.5, 3.5 divided by 1.05. So this is 3.33 plus second year, 103.5 divided by 101.05 to the power of two. So that's 93.88. So if we're going to add these, that's going to give us 97.21. So the answer is C. Uh, let's see how many people got it right. Ah, oh, most of you got it right. Nice. Nine. Sorry. A company has issued convertible loan stock, which can convert into 80 ordinary shares per 100 nominal. So if I buy this convertible bond, I'm going to get 80 shares when the bond is converted. So how much am I going to pay for this bond? Or in other words, how much will this uh, 80 shares cost me? The convertible is trading at 160 pounds. So if I pay 160 pounds nominal, I'm going to get one bond. And that bond is going to give me 80 shares. Right? So each share is therefore costing me, so 160 over 80. So each share is costing me two pounds. If I get the share through the bond. Or I can go to the market and buy it at 1.8 pounds or 180 pence. So I can go to the market and I can buy it at 1.8 pounds. 
So obviously, if I go through the convertible bond, I am paying, if I go through the convertible bond, I am paying two pounds for every share. But if I go to the market, I can buy it at 1.8 pounds. So there is a premium here. I am paying extra. How much is the premium? The premium is an extra 0 0.20 per share. By choosing to get the shares through the bond, I am paying 20 pence per share. 20 pence over the market. How much is that in percentage wise? 20 pence divided by 1.8. So 0 0.2 divided by 1.8. So I am paying 11. 11% premium. So the answer is B. Because I chose to get these shares through the convertible one, I am paying 20 pence extra over the market price. The market price is 1.8. Is I am paying 20 pence. That is a 11% premium over market.